Well, here we are, Unit 7, AP Euro. This is my second time doing this video. I recorded this once, I got 50 minutes into it, and I realized Screencastify had <laughs> crashed. <laughs> so if this is a good video, it's because I practiced. If this is a bad video, the first video was better. <laughs> You can see we're doing 19th century perspectives and political developments here. A lot of important stuff in Unit 7. This is our last unit in the 19th century. And believe it or not, we're two-thirds of the way through the course at, at this point. So Unit 7 topics, you can see um, up there on the unit as a glance, I took this from the AP Euro curriculum framework. So the curriculum that we are working with. As per usual, we're not really going to cover topics 7.1 and 7.9 too much in class because those are really skill-based and we work in the skills while we're doing the rest of the content. And so when we break down topics 7.2 through 7.8, we're really dealing with what I think are four topics. We're dealing with nationalism, that's 7.2 and 7.3. We're dealing with social Darwinism, which College Board thinks is important enough to separate out into its own topic, despite the fact that I think it's pretty closely related to imperialism. Progress and the coming of modernity, which is 7.5 and also kind of 7.8. You can see their 19th century culture and art. And then imperialism, which is 7.6 and 7.7. .7. I think that if you took World History Honors or AP World your freshman year, a lot of this should be review similar to maybe last unit. At least I hope that's your experience with it because I know in AP World we cover this stuff um, in some level of detail. You know, AP World is obviously not Eurocentric, but we're getting to the point of the AP World curriculum where we're really focusing on Europe. So 7.1, just a little context for what it is we're going to be studying here. When we look at 19th century political developments, and there's social developments in here as well, but really we're focusing on a lot of political developments. And when we consider that, we really have to look to the French Revolution. That video that we watched in class, one of the historians said that the French Revolution is the most important event in modern world history. That may be an overstatement, but when we're talking about modern European history, the French Revolution is incredibly important. Um, I'm going to highlight two reasons here for when we're talking about contextualizing this unit. We have to think about the French Revolution as that event that really brings about nationalism in a powerful and potent way in Europe. It doesn't create nationalism. Nationalism had um, been brewing for a while in Europe and elsewhere. We can look at the American colonies in the 1760s as an example of this. But when we're talking about unleashing nationalism across Europe, the French Revolution is a perfect start point for that. Um, I've heard it described as looking at the French Revolution as letting a genie out of the bottle. And once you open that bottle, it's really hard to get the genie back in. And that's nationalism in the French Revolution. The other thing that the French Revolution does is it destroys the Ancien Regime, which is this informal regime that existed for hundreds of years. And um, really, if we go back to the Peace of Westphalia at 1648, the Ancien Regime is what had been the prevailing organizing force in Europe when we're talking about the political relations between the countries. Well, the French Revolution destroys that um, irreparably. The wars of the revolution in the 1790s, and then of course with Napoleon in the first um, decade of the 1800s. The Ancien Regime is going to be replaced by the Congress of Vienna and the Concert of Europe, which is going to be a mixed bag. If we're looking at the positives from 1815 until 1914, almost 100 years, there are no major conflicts in Europe. However, when we look at the success rate of the Concert of Europe, it's ultimately going to fail. It's going to lead to World War I, the greatest war that Europe had ever seen up until that point. Um, second, we're going to look a lot at imperialism in this unit. And so when we consider imperialism, we have to consider this long history of colonialism that we see in European history. Colonialism has been around since the, the 15th century, since the late 1400s. And for about 350 years almost, from the late 1400s until the mid-1800s, 
colonialism is just kind of chugging along. There's not a lot of inroads that Europeans are making um, into the interior of places like Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, the Americas, although we're not going to deal with the Americas too much. What happens is that in the second half of the 19th century, due to a confluence of factors, which we're going to take a look at, colonialism really intensifies. But when we're contextualizing this time period, we need to think about that long history of colonialism. We need to place imperialism in that. And third, cultural tension is also going to be a key component of this unit, science and objectivity unleashed by scientific revolution, go back to the 16th century, and that tension between science and objectivity versus subjectivity and individual expression. This is not a new tension, but in some ways it's going to be accelerating in this, uh, in this unit and in this time period. So 7.2 deals with nationalism. So nationalism is pride in one's nation. We need to remember what a nation is. A nation is a group of people who share a decent amount of things in common. Some combination of language, religion, culture, customs, beliefs. It doesn't have to be all of those things, but it has to be a good deal of them. And another one of the keys here is that the people believe themselves to be similar. They believe themselves to be members of the same nation. Now, there are some caveats to that. I can't just wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I'm I'm Russian. Um, I don't speak Russian. I've never been to Russia. I don't have any Russian relations. Um, but I could move to Russia. I could live there for a while. I could learn Russian and my nationality could morph into Russian. Um, and so choice is an important part of it, but it's more than just choice. It's important to also remember what a nation is not. A nation is not a country. Um, a nation can be a part of a country, and we can uh, look at countries as nation states. When we look around the world today, a lot of countries are nation states. But a nation is not inherently a country. That being said, by the time we get to the 19th century, there are um, an increasing number of politicians in Europe and throughout the rest of the world who are beginning to see the natural endpoint of nationalism as the nation state. If you want peace and stability and you want members of a nation to be happy, you're going to need to give them their own country. Now, that's a process that's still playing out today in the 21st century, so I don't want to overstate it, but this is the genie in the bottle thing again. When nationalism is unleashed, for many, the end result is going to be the spread of the nation state. Loyalty to the nation is encouraged in a variety of ways throughout the 19th century. Some of these are used by conservatives. Some of these are used by liberals. Nationalism is not an ideology that is exclusive to one side of the political spectrum, and we need to remember that. So um, one of these ways is romantic idealism probably no better summation of this than Lady Liberty in the French Revolution. And you can just look at this and you can see the romantic notion of fighting for a nation, giving one's life for a nation. A lot of the French Revolution is about this. And many of the French revolutionaries are galvanized by this romantic belief in their nationhood, in the fact that they are citizens of France and they share that. Um, this is going to be idealized throughout the 19th century and beyond. Second, liberal reform efforts. Liberals are going to seek to use nationalism in order to, to bring people together around the idea of rights. Um, we don't need to look much beyond our country, the United States, to see this. One of the things that makes us a nation that is very different and has lots of different groups in it, one of the things that brings us together is the idea that we all share common rights and we all believe in these rights, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the amendments that come afterwards. This is a good example of liberal reform efforts. Third, political unification. Um, we're actually going to see two kind of different trends that are happening politically in Europe during the 19th century. We're going to see these big dynastic states that are being torn apart 
due to nationalism. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is a good example of this. The Ottoman Empire is another good example of this. So these large states that have multiple nationalities in them, they're multi-ethnic, they're going to be torn down in really in the early 20th century, but that process is going to be playing out in the late 19th century. But we're also going to have the reverse of that. We're going to have very small states that are being unified. Germany and Italy are the two best examples of this. Small principalities, city-states, um, kingdoms that are going to come together, they're going to come to believe themselves to be one nation. Fourth, um, loyalty to the nation is also encouraged by what I refer to as othering. We are X nation, they are Y nation. Anti-Semitism in Europe is a good example of this. Um, think about Adolf Hitler in the 1930s. One of the ways he encourages German nationalism is by turning Germans against the Jews, the Jewish population of Germany and Europe. Um, this is going to be happening throughout the 19th century in various places in Europe. Race theory and um, racializing groups is another example of this process of, of othering. What we also see with nationalism is its spread, going back to the genie in the bottle analogy. So Jewish nationalism and Zionism is going to emerge in the second half of the 19th century, and that's going to culminate in the creation of Israel after World War II in 1948. I mentioned that conservatives are going to use nationalism to strengthen their states. Otto von Bismarck, um, with the unification of Germany, he is the leader, um, well, he is the prime minister of um, Prussia and later Germany. Uh, and Cavour in Italy is another good example of a conservative who is going to be using nationalism to unify um, um, a state. Last, Pan-Slavism. We're really going to talk more about Pan-Slavism in the context of World War I um, when we get to our next unit. I think World War I is in Unit 8. Don't quote me on that. But Pan-Slavism is a movement to unite all Slavic peoples under one state, one, under one nation state. And you can see the different Slavic groups on the map of Eastern, well, it's all, all Europe, but you see them in primarily Eastern Europe. The area that we're really going to focus on is down here in the Balkans prior to World War I. There's a lot of Slavic nationalism that is occurring there, and uh, it relates to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is ruling over some of these um, Slavic lands. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to World War I. 7.3 is also about um, nationalism, and you can see this one is a little bit more politically minded than the last one. Last one was a, a, an overview of nationalism, I suppose, and this one is the effects in some ways. So German and Italian unification, I've already mentioned both of them. They are both complete by 1871. Italy is like 1870, 1871. Um, Germany is 1871. Both of these have their roots in Napoleonic Europe, and in the nationalism that Napoleon brings when he invades all of Europe, there are a lot of people when Napoleon shows up with his Napoleonic code and his French armies who say, wait a second, you're French and we are not. We are German. We are Spanish. We are um, definitely not what you are. Um, and so Napoleon is going to bring nationalism with him. Unintended consequence of Napoleon's invasion of um, these places, but it is definitely a consequence. And the revolutions of 1848 are another, another example of where German and Italian unification have their roots. All of these revolutions in 1848 are put down, but um, nationalism is a very potent force and it's very difficult for rulers of states who want to tamp down nationalism to get rid of it. There are some rulers who want to encourage nationalism, but there are some who see nationalism as a threat. Um, they're really not going to be able to do anything about nationalism in the long run. So German unification, this is a wonderful map um, that details German unification really from 1815 with the Congress of Vienna until 1871 when that process is complete. And I do put air quotes around complete because Germany is going to be haggling over land all the way through World War II. But you can see the outline of the modern German state here. Prussia, which is the most powerful of the German states, is going to be the, the leader of this unification. Otto von Bismarck is going to be the architect, and he's going to be doing this through a process that he refers to as real politique. Um, and he makes a very famous 
speech where he says Germany will be unified through blood and iron. Um, he is he is not going about this peacefully. The German states, some of them are choosing to join in this German Union, but some of them are not, and they are invaded and forcibly unified into the German state. And that process is played out by 1871. Um, for for the most part, you know, Alsace-Lorraine is still going to be a point of contention all the way up until through World War II, and much of this area over here is eventually going to be carved off into Poland. But um, for the most part, it's it's over by 1871. Similar story with Italy. Um, Savoy starts the unification process, unifies and becomes the kingdom of Sardinia with Sardinia here. And from there, the Italian peninsula is, again, forcibly unified um, by Giuseppe Garibaldi and Cavour and the other Italian nationalists. This process, again, I put air quotes around it, is going to be done by 1870, 1871. And those air quotes are because of a few things. One, the papal states are never unified. The papal states even today are, are their own independent country, smallest country in the world. And this little sliver of land up here is not going to be annexed by Italy until you can see after World War I. But for the most part, Italian unification is done by um, 1870. Okay. Um, second, diplomatic tensions, the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856. The only war that we're going to mention in AP Euro during the 19th century, at least after 1815 and the Napoleonic Wars, we can consider the Crimea Crimean War as relatively minor, at least when compared to World War I. It's a conflict over the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is falling apart and has been falling apart for some time. It has been losing land for the last 200 years or so. And the Ottoman Empire gets the nickname the Sick Man of Europe in the late 19th century because it is just collapsing. The great powers are very interested in this. Russia is very interested in it. Russia is interested in having access to warm water ports and having access to the Mediterranean. And Britain and France are interested in making sure Russia does not have that. Uh, and so out of this, um, as well as a myriad other factors is born the Crimean War. It leads to a realignment of power on the uh, on the continent, it leads to some soul searching um, by uh, <laughs> by all of the great powers, but really by um, by Russia, and it's going to lead to a further acceleration of imperialism. It shows the breakdown of the concert of Europe as well. The concert of Europe is going to limp along, but the concert of Europe is not going to be successful in the end, which I already alluded to. Otto von Bismarck, I already mentioned with uh, the real politique, so I won't belabor the point. And um, yeah, the alliance system and the Balkan tensions, these are also both things that I'm going to talk about more with World War I, but the alliance system you can see emerges in the 1870s. Um, the first alliance to be really solidified there is the, the Triple Alliance by 1882. And in response to that, about 20 years later, you're going to have the Triple Entente. These two alliances are going to go on to become essentially World War One. Italy's going to break off from that Triple Alliance um, and form the Entente uh, and join the Entente eventually. But we're seeing these diplomatic tensions playing out, um, and we see them in the Balkans as well in uh, in 1913. Again, that's a little more context for uh, for World War One. So 7.4 is um, Darwinism and social Darwinism. It's kind of an odd one for me because like I said, I think this is a part of imperialism, but AP Euro, I'm, I'm sure they know better than I do since this is my first year teaching the course. It is certainly significant. I don't want to downplay the significance of it. Charles Darwin pictured here publishes on the origin of species, which is the unifying theory of the life sciences as they exist today. So incredibly important work. Darwin is a fascinating figure. He goes on a around the world voyage. He's a naturalist. He's British. Um, in the early 1830s on the HMS Beagle, which is one of my favorite, favorite ship names. Nothing, nothing more regal than a Beagle. While he's on the voyage, he tries to account for the the variety that he is seeing across the world in 
all of the species. And he comes up with his theory of evolution. By the late 1830s, he pretty much has this theory in his brain. He knows this is where he wants to go, but he takes the next 20 plus years to research it further, to make the argument and to talk it out with some of his other peers. He knows that this is going to be massive um, because the theory of evolution cuts at the very bedrock of Christian theology and the notion of um, intelligent design and our creation as human beings by God. He publishes this work in 1859, and by the early 19, uh, 1870s, excuse me, it's generally accepted um, within the scientific community and even amongst the layperson. This is not to say that it's not controversial, and there are elements of the theory of evolution that remain very controversial um, throughout the rest of the 19th century and into the 20th century, natural selection probably being chief among them. But I say this to kind of push back against this misnomer that evolution as a theory is not accepted for like, you know, 150 years or something like that. It's kind of like people who say that, you know, they, they thought Columbus was going to sail off the edge of the world. That's, that's not really entirely accurate. Evolution and the theory of evolution was certainly controversial, but it's pretty widely accepted within the scientific community pretty quickly. Now, what really matters, <laughs> I think, in terms of AP Euro, is social Darwinism. Because what happens is the idea of natural selection that Darwin posits becomes perverted. Um, it becomes applied in a way that Darwin never intended it to be applied. And it is applied in a way that justifies a lot of really heinous beliefs and actions in the latter stages of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Darwin said of natural selection that essentially traits or characteristics that an organism has that prove to be beneficial will lead to them having a better chance of survival. And he's talking about this over hundreds or thousands of generations. Um, you know, a good example of this is um, birds. Darwin is very interested in birds. The Darwin finches are um, a good example of this. Uh, we can take birds that live right here um, in our own backyard. So the, um, the American goldfinch, for example. When you look at the male of the American goldfinch, it's bright yellow. Um, now, why is it bright yellow? Well, two reasons. One, to attract females. And two, because the American goldfinch feeds on sunflower seeds. Sunflowers are bright yellow. So in the summertime, the yellow is a advantage for the goldfinch. However, in the winter, yellow is not an advantage. The sunflowers have died. All the leaves have fallen off the trees. If this bird remained bright yellow, it would be easy prey for predators like hawks. And so over hundreds, thousands, millions of generations, the American goldfinch has evolved to turn brown in the winter. This is natural selection. Um, what social Darwinists say is, right, natural selection, the survival of the fittest. To them, this means that the strong prevail, the weak do not, and this is the natural way of things. And so social Darwinism is applied not to hundreds, thousands, millions of generations, but social Darwinism is applied to the immediate present. It is a justification for imperialism. It is a justification for racism. And social Darwinism is going to be really popular throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries as a justification for Europeans being the best. It's important to note Darwin never subscribe to this. Darwin did not have anything to do with this. His name is associated with it uh, simply because of the way that social Darwinism emerged out of the Darwinian theory of evolution. Um, so yeah, that's social Darwinism.
Moving right along, I think for you, this is good news. This, this is actually going to be shorter than the first time I did it, so that's good. Um, 7.5 is a lot about philosophy, and I'll be the first to say this is not my area of expertise. So feel free to um, do some research on your own. Ask me some questions. I'll be happy to answer them the best way I can. I'll also be happy to do some research as well if you and I feel like we need to do that to, uh, to get through this. Um, there's a couple, really two points that I want to stress in 7.5, two lines of thinking that emerge in the 19th century. The first is positivism. Positivism is this idea that science, reason, and logic alone provide knowledge, that the use of science, mathematics, data, empirical observation is where we get knowledge from. This is very closely linked to the idea of the Enlightenment. Positivism is um, associated with this man, Augustus Comte, who in 1848 publishes his general view of positivism. And for AP Euro, the significance here is that this is the birth of sociology and the sociological method. Sociology is a social science, and sociology is the, the discipline of studying society through scientific methods. Sociology is born out of Comte's ideas that the scientific method should be applied to our study of society in order for us to truly gain knowledge about it. Um, if you're saying this sounds familiar, yeah, it. I mean, it is. It's familiar to the Enlightenment, and it has its its roots in the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution. Um, but it's going to be uh, clearly drawn out in the middle of the 19th century. I guess that's how I would I would put it. Second, and very different than positivism, is irrationality. And if we're going to associate a name with this, I think Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzsche should be the name that we associate with this. Nietzsche is probably the second most famous philosopher of the 19th century, next to Freud. Um, there are a lot of candidates there, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, I suppose. But Nietzsche is um, quite famous for the amount of writing that he does and for his reject rejection of objective reality. He argues that knowledge is cont contingent and conditional Basically, that it is relative to various fluid perspectives or interests that change over time and change by the individual. And so um, this, this is what becomes called perspectivism. Um, and it's the idea that knowledge is almost impossible to nail down because it is ever-changing. You can see how this is very different than positivism, which is like very scientific. And if we study things and we experiment with things and we hypothesize and we, ha we gather evidence, Nietzsche says that's, that's all an illusion in a sense, because objective reality is created by the individual and it's always changing. The other thing that um, Nietzsche is associated with is nihilism. Um, and nihilism is the idea that life lacks meaning. We're getting, we're getting very dark here. Um, it's um, not something that Nietzsche is necessarily comfortable with. He comes to this conclusion and he says that, that nihilism is something that we have to fight against. He, he refers to this as the despair of meaninglessness. Um, the classic image of, of nihilism is the the human being alone um, screaming into the void um, and the void not saying anything back, of course. Um, and so that's, you know, that's nihilism. Nietzsche believes that um, Christian moral doctrine provides people with intrinsic value, um, a belief in God and a basis for their objective knowledge about the world. He rejects this. And so he rejects it and he says, so what am I left with? Nihilism. I'm left with nihilism. Sigmund Freud is, you know, I mentioned him already, and of course you know him. Struggle between the conscious and the unconscious. We have a lot of irrationality in here. The id, the ego, the superego, the exploration of dreams, all those things we know about Freud. Quantum mechanics. 
talk about irrational. You know, Isaac Newton in the 1680s puts forward his three laws of motion. This is great. Physics is easy. Three laws of motion. One, two, three. Quantum mechanics comes along late 19th century. Oh, well, there's like dark matter and there's quarks and there's strings and um, it gets irrational pretty quick. Maybe my favorite example of irrationality during the late 19th and early 20th century is the Rite of Spring. The Rite of Spring is um, an opera and a, uh, a concerto. I think it's a concerto. It's a musical piece by uh, Igor Stravinsky. It premieres in 1913. And there's this very apocryphal story about the Rite of Spring. Allegedly, when it premiered, um, it was so heinous to the crowd. This was in Paris that there was actually a riot. Um, in the opera house and outside of the opera house. Um, now I say apocryphal because this probably isn't true, um, but the Rite of Spring um, is, <laughs> it depicts various primitive rituals celebrating the, the coming of spring, the advent of spring, after which a young girl is chosen as a sacrificial victim of the, the pagan community where she lives and she dances herself to death. <laughs> um, the Rite of Spring played for its initial run and then it went away for um, a while into the 1920s because there was a very strong reaction against it because it was just so weird. Hence irrationality. Okay, 7.6 and 7.7 7 imperialism. Motivations and methods here is 7.6. You should know a lot of these and a lot of this should be review, I hope. So I am going to go a little bit quicker through this. Causation. Um, I'm going to break it down by categories of analysis. So political, national rivalries, the balance of power. We see that in the political cartoon over here, which maybe you've seen before. The great powers of Europe represented stylistically Queen Victoria and England, the Kaiser and Germany, the Tsar and Russia, Lady Liberty and France, and a newcomer who we'll talk about in a moment, Japan. And then um, look at that. This nice representation of race theory and how Europeans are racializing the other um, with China back here. And so the, the great Western powers, I should say imperial powers. We don't want to include Japan in the West um, quite yet. Um, but the great imperial powers are carving up China here. So national rivalries, the obsession with the balance of power and making sure that one country or one group of countries cannot become too powerful um, AKA the Napoleonic outcome. Second, economic industrialization, of course. One of the reasons why imperialism comes about, why colonialism, this thing that had kind of chugged along for 350 years in basically the same form, all of a sudden radically changes in the second half of the 19th century is because Europeans can. Europeans can do this with new weapons, new transportation methods, railroad, um, steamships, canals, communication methods, the telegraph. This makes control of huge inland areas possible. Armies are can be quickly mobilized to put down revolts. Um, colonial administrators can get guidance from their home countries quickly. Uh, Industrialization, imperialism doesn't happen without industrialization. So we, we absolutely have to consider that. Second for economic, the markets for goods and raw materials that colonies provide. Colonies provide both of these things, markets and materials. The, the colonies for the European powers are like this closed system, basically. European powers take the raw materials back to the home country. They create things. Uh, manufactured goods in the factories, and then they ship them back to the colonies again. The argument is made over and over throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries that imperialism is good for the economies of these European nations. In reality, it probably isn't. Imperialism is unbelievably expensive. It's probably um, a cost negative venture. What matters for us, however, is to know that this argument is made over and over again, that capitalist countries, and that's the third point here, need markets for their goods, and they need cheap raw materials if they are going to compete, if they are going to be competitive. And so the economic factors are very, very strong 
in, in, in propelling European countries towards imperialism. This is Cecil Rhodes. Maybe you remember that name from world history, maybe not. Cecil Rhodes is a great example of the European capitalist who goes down to Africa, makes a fortune, he buys up a bunch of diamond mines, and then he pressures the British government to protect his interests. He is British, he's employing other British people, he is serving the British crown. And so what's going to happen is these European countries, they do want imperialism, but they're also being sucked into imperialism by soldiers of fortune like Cecil Rhodes. Um, this political cartoon is a riff on the, the Colossus of Rhodes, which is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was this huge statue that stood astride of the harbor at Rhodes. Um, and so the artist is playing on that with Cecil Rhodes here, the Rhodes Colossus. And he is stringing a telegraph wire from Cairo to Cape Town. One of Rhodes's ideas was to unify the African continent north to south under the British flag, and he was going to do it through industrial methods, the telegraph, the railroad. It never happened, but the British got pretty close, as we'll see. Social, we already talked about social Darwinism and, of course, Christianity and the civilizing mission. So we combine all these factors together for methods and motivation. And what do we get? This is what we get. By 1900, there are really five powers in the Eastern Hemisphere. Take out the Western Hemisphere for a moment. In the Eastern Hemisphere, we have Europe. We have Russia, which I'll separate out. The Ottoman Empire. China and Japan. That's really it. The rest of the territory that we see are either very, very tiny independent countries, Ethiopia in Africa, Liberia in Africa, Siam in Southeast Asia. But for the most part, the rest of the territory has been colonized. Most notable here is, of course, Africa. You guys remember the scramble for Africa. Um, Southeast Asia, also, there's a decent scramble for as well. But Africa is our best example of imperialism and um, what happens. Our own country gets involved in imperialism, of course, with the, uh, the Philippines. The United States appears on this map as an imperial power in 1900. And uh, with some territory over here, too small to see, but, you know, Puerto Rico and uh, is Guam on this map. I don't know. Guam's not on this map. Um, is Hawaii on this map? No, Hawaii's not on this map. Points to it. That's European history. Get out of it. Get out of it. So the effects. Um, well, you just saw them. <laughs> Huge. This is when the sun never sets on the British Empire. Over 200 million people are subjects of the British Empire. Effects on Europe, um, diplomatic tensions, the Berlin Conference is a good example of this, England, um, the United Kingdom, uh, essentially takes control of Egypt in the early 1800s, and some of the other great powers start getting worried that Britain is going to become too powerful. Remember this balance of power, so they call the Berlin Conference and just start carving up Africa, just drawing arbitrary lines on the map of Africa. If you look at a map of Africa today and you've ever wondered, why are the lines so straight? It's because they were drawn by a bunch of Europeans who didn't really care what the lines, um, who lived there, they didn't care. There was not a single African president at the Berlin Conference. The Moroccan crisis in 1905 and the Balkan crisis of 1913, both of these are going to be talked about more in the lead up to World War One. So in the interest of trying to keep this video um, short, I'll, uh, I'll just skip past them. Debates over imperialism. There are reform associations. It's important to note that there are people who are against imperialism. Problematically for us as 21st century observers, a lot of these people were not making arguments that we would consider to be moral. They do not align with our morals, at least. There are a lot of anti-imperialists who are saying we should not colonize places because we don't want to dirty ourselves with those um, heathens. We don't want them to be a part of our country or our empire. And so when we hear about the anti-imperialists, it's easy for us with our 21st century um, ideas to think, oh, yes, yes, people who are against imperialism, these were the good guys. Um, in some instances, sure, there are people who are making arguments that we would consider palatable, but there are also anti-imperialists who are not. And so we need to just see the nuance in that. 
and we need to be cautious about that as students of history. The Congo Reform Association is a good example of a group that is trying to reform one of the worst areas for um, European imperialism, which was the Belgian Congo. Somewhere over 10 million Africans are going to die as a direct or indirect, indirect result of what the Belgians, specifically King Leopold, since it is his colony, he owns it, um, are doing in, in the Congo. Another anti-imperialist, Vladimir Lenin. You know, the Soviet Union is going to emerge in 1917. The Soviet Union, a lot of its rhetoric is anti-imperialist. Soviet Union, we know, is going to go on to have its own problems. But if we're talking about reactions to imperialism and anti-imperialism, um, Vladimir Lenin, we should absolutely include him. You know, for me, what I'm probably most interested in um, is the reaction of colonial peoples. Europe kind of brings it on, brings this on itself. So, so I don't really feel too bad about the diplomatic tensions brought about by imperialism for, uh, for Europe. However, when we look at the um, effects on colonial peoples, they're absolutely massive. The responses that colonial peoples are going to have to imperialism are going to vary, but we can really fit them into a couple different categories. Political responses, the Indian National Congress is a good example, an attempt by um, the Indians, primarily Hindus, but also Muslims um, at the start. Um, Muslims are going to break away in the early 1900s, um, but uh, it's um, it's both in the Indian National Congress. They're going to advocate for political reforms from Britain. Uh, met with a decent amount of success, um, but it's going to take until the 1920s and 1930s, really. The Meiji Restoration, I wouldn't call the Japanese colonial peoples, but America shows up with a, with a fleet of ships in the 1850s and Japan is powerless to do anything about it. The Meiji Restoration is a response um, by, the, um, by the Japanese to try to catch up to the Western world, and they are very successful. Um, 1905, the Russo-Japanese War, um, Japan defeats Russia in uh, a war, 1904-1905. Second, anti-colonial rebellions. The Sepoy Mutiny or the Indian Rebellion of 1857 is a good example of a challenge from colonial peoples. The Sepoys who were Indian troops employed by the British, a number of them revolt. Um, and they revolt because of a variety of reasons. The spark that, that lights the fire is that the British made this change to gunpowder cartridges. They lined them with animal fat. And um, soldiers had to put them in their teeth to rip open these paper cartridges. And the animal fat was rumored to be a mixture of pork and beef. And you have these sepoys who are a mix of Hindus and Muslims. Well, you're offending both of them um, by, by doing this. Uh, and so, you know, all of a sudden you have Muslims who are saying, we can't eat pork. And you have Hindus who are saying, we can't eat beef. And the British who are saying, we don't care. There's your spark. Um, the Sepoy Mutiny is significant um, for a couple reasons. It's significant because the British crown is going to step in and make India a crown colony. It had not been that prior to 1857. It had been controlled by the, the East India Trading Company, basically. Um, Britain is going to take direct control of it in 1857. But also the Sepoy Mutiny is... A great example of how nationalism is spreading, not just in Europe, but uh, around the world. The Boxer Rebellion, another good example of an anti-colonial um, revolt, this time in China by a group of people, the Boxers, the Society of Harmonious and Righteous Fists. I think that's what it is. Um, group of people who wanted foreigners out of China. Unsuccessful revolt, um, but again, it Scared the hell out of Westerners who were in China at the time, and it's further evidence that colonial peoples are willing to revolt and lose their lives against imperialism, in, in rising up against imperialism. Lastly, um, there's this um, paradox here that's going on. European powers are both developing and exploiting colonies. They're developing colonies. They're bringing railroads, they're bringing European technology, they're bringing education, they're bringing um, European governance, the enlightenment, all these sorts of things. Um, but they're also exploiting the colonies. They're changing a lot of colonies into single crop colonies, which is going to destroy these, these places once imperialism ends and the imperial powers wash their hands of these colonies. They're exploiting the people for labor. There's no 
better way to see the ramifications of imperialism than looking at Africa today. Africa is a place with an incredible variety of riches in both natural resources and their people. And yet Africa still has not recovered from the imperial exploits that occurred during the, the 19th and 20th centuries. Last slide. <laughs> we did it. God, I hope this is recording. Um, 19th century culture and arts. Another area that I am not an expert in by any stretch of the imagination, but I wanted to give it a cursory look because I do think it is, it's emphasized by the AP Euro curriculum. So we'll take a look at it. Romanticism, we've already talked about romanticism, but this is a movement that is placing emphasis on emotion and nature. It's a reaction against the enlightenment or at least a contrast to the enlightenment. It's also um, a reaction against industrialization and the standardization of the human experience. There's a lot of people who see industrialization in Europe as this profoundly dehumanizing thing. Um, and it also rips humans away from nature. People are spending their lives in windowless factories, in smog-filled cities. Romanticism is a reaction to that. It's also a reaction to nationalism. Unlike industrialization, where romanticism is looking at industrialization negatively, nationalism, we already saw how romanticism and nationalism are partnered up. Um, realism, oh, sorry, I'll get to realism in a moment. Um, Examples of Romanticism, Francisco Goya, uh, Ludwig von Beethoven, Victor Hugo, good examples. Um, Francisco Goya is a, a Spanish painter. This is one of his works from 1808 called The Second of May. Uh, and it is in relation to the uh, a rebellion that occurs during Napoleonic um, uh, occupation of, of Spain and um, one of the events that sparks the Peninsular War. Uh, and so you can see, I mean, it, it looks very similar to the, the painting of Lady Liberty from earlier on, you know, this glorification of fighting for the nation, in this case, um, Spain. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to go through <laughs> all of this. Um, Victor Hugo as romantic. I thought this was a great summation. And um, I included the source up there in case you want to get anything else on it. But Victor Hugo, most famous for Les Miserables. It's probably his most famous work. But Victor Hugo, notice I gave you, I gave you an artist, artist, I gave you a musician, and I gave you a writer. Um, because we see these, these strains of romanticism, not just in art, not just in painting, but we see it all throughout European society. And so I thought Victor Hugo was a good, um, good representation of that. So if you want to pause it, go back to it. You can uh, read a little about Victor Hugo. Okay, Realism is going to contrast against romanticism. Realism is going to focus on the depiction of the lives of ordinary people. Oftentimes, the realists are going to focus on social problems, not always, but often. They're going to be very interested in the middle and lower classes. Um, Charles Dickens is a great example of this. We see this in almost all of Dickens' work, the poor, downtrodden, um, you know, wretches of, of these English industrial cities in the 19th century. George Eliot is another good example of this. George Eliot, real name Marianne Evans. George Eliot was her pen name. She um, took a male pen name because there were other women who were, who were writing and publishing at the time, but for the most part, women were relegated to writing romantic novels and Eliot did not want to be pigeonholed um, into that. And so she wrote, um, I think seven novels, um, which are known for their realism, their sense of place, um, their accurate depictions of um, English life. And so, um, yeah, that's a little bit about George Eliot. I think that's Dickens and Eliot are great examples of, um, of realism. Last, um, modern art. I'm going to give you some examples of all four of these here. Impressionism, post-impressionism, cubism, and abstract art. All four of these movements are really happening um, concurrently, I guess you could say, right around the same time, 1870 to 1920, that's 50 years. Cubism and abstract art is going to come later on in that time period, impressionism and post-impressionism early on. But they're all right around that 50-year time period, 1870 to 1920. Some names that I have no doubt you know, Monet, Cezanne, Picasso, and Van Gogh. Hey, that rhymed. Um, impressionism, Roughly 1870 to 1900, Monet, 
the most famous impressionist painter, woman with a parasol, and then Cezanne, Bend in the Road. Um, the impressionists are painting contemporary landscapes, scenes of modern life, but they're really focusing on the bourgeoisie. They're focusing on leisure. When you look at impressionist paintings, they're idyllic. You know, they're calming. They're not. Um, they're not painting historical figures or, you know, mythological figures or religious figures or anything like that. They're, they're paying attention to atmosphere, to movement, to feeling. Um, hence the term impressionism. What's the impression that you get? Post-impressionism, which notice you also see Cezanne here, is like 1880 to 1910, but they're kind of going on at the same time. Cezanne is on both because in his early years, he's an impressionist. He's a compatriot of Monet. Um, they're both French. They're both working in, in France. Um, but Cezanne is going to break with the Impressionists, and his art is going to um, change in style. And you can see that not only in style, but in um, what's being painted in the Pyramid of Skulls in, in 1901. Um, so we consider him him both. Uh, the post-Impressionists, Vincent van Gogh here, another example, they're going to be rejecting the Impressionists' concern with this naturalistic um, rendering of light and color and um, impressions. They're going to favor looking at symbolic content, formal order, structure, those types of, of things. Third, cubism, which, you know, Picasso <laughs> is the most famous example here. Every Picasso is a great example of cubism. This is like, you know, right at the tail end of our time period, 1910 into the 1920s. And we're getting into the era of, of modern art. Um, last abstract art, same deal. We're, we're starting to talk about modern art, early 20th century. Um, but we're seeing abstract representations of life, of um, the human experience. And so, um, yeah, Matisse is probably the best example from this time period, um, early 20th century, Henry Matisse. <sighs> we did it. Believe it or not, this was shorter than my first go around. <laughs> so I'm sorry it was so long. Um, I love talking about this stuff and there's so much good stuff in Unit 7. So hope you got something from it and uh, I'll see you in class.